I'd like to ask if uh, the two people who've meant so much to Corn have watched her develop as a young lady over these last uh, five or six years in the teen ministry, if they would each give a word first, starting with Mrs. Melody Scott, and then later in the service, Brother David Scott, this is our teen ministry director and his wife, and Melody also then serves as Chorus Sunday School teacher as well as working with her in the teen ministry. So just, just from, from her own heart, some impressions about Miss Cora Balser. Okay, so I wrote some things down so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> but Cora has always been one of those people that when she comes in, she just makes it more fun. And she likes to joke around in the girls' class. She likes to talk to all the girls. And um, when she first started in the team ministry, she was a little quiet. She was a little shy. And uh, she hated having her picture taken. I think she still does, doesn't she? <laughs> she didn't like that. I would try. I would try and catch her and get her picture. And she would, she would hide. So I always told her, I said, you keep getting these funny faces in all my pictures because you keep turning your head. <laughs> but she wouldn't listen. That's right. But she's always faithful in her place. She's there every Sunday. She's there every Wednesday. I can count on her to um, do things for her if I ask her something. And... Um, She's very compassionate. She has a lot of, in our Sunday school class, we take prayer requests. And one thing I will say about Cora, she's always the first to raise her hand with a prayer request, and she always goes, hi. <laughs> and I say, yes, Cora. And she always has a prayer request. Most of the time, it's always for someone else. And she has a lot of concern and compassion for other people. And that's very special. And I hope that she continues that. And she always has a concern for others and looks She's, you know, it's, and the, and the prayer requests range from, you know, salvation of this person, or this person's just having a hard time, or it could be any number of things, but she's always concerned and um, compassionate about um, other people. And she's always been the one, there are two girls in our uh, Wednesday night class that the guys are like, Whenever we do a game, they always assume, right, gentlemen, the girls are going to win, right? They just always assume it, and the girls usually do. And the reasons are because of Cora and Lauren, <laughs> the two of them. And they always think if, if for some reason Cora's not in the room, we might win. And then Cora walks in, and they go, oh. <laughs> but she's always great fun. And she, I've been having my girls do... Um, testimonies and devotions in Sunday school, I'm trying to help them get up and speak in front of people. And Cora has so far gone through all of the things I've listed, and she has done um, two things that really stood out. She did a great devotion. I asked them to do a five-minute devotion, and she brought her devotion. In fact, she was the first one to volunteer, and she brought forth some really great thoughts and points that tell me that she's reading her Bible and she's thinking about what she's reading. Amen and she's um, developing a walk with the Lord or has developed a walk with the Lord. And she put great thought into it and she did a wonderful job. And this morning, I had them do an object lesson and it, she chose to do it. I, I told her she could have it off because this is her day, but she says, no, no, I'll do it anyway. And she did and she brought a great um, object lesson about forks. So if you wanna know, you can ask her. <laughs> but it was very, it had, she had very good points and she speaks very clearly, so you can be very proud of Cora. She does a great job. And so we've just enjoyed having her, and I know we get to keep her. I hope she'll stay through, through August, but we're gonna be very sad when she leaves our teen group, but she's been a great addition. Thank you so much, Mrs. Scott. One of the good news is we still have Ethan in the team ministry, so the treats teens will continue from the Balser kitchen for a, a little while longer. <laughs> and that's pretty critical in this church. <laughs> that keeps us going. That and coffee, amen? So uh, we, are, we are grateful for that. We would like to have you now meet the graduate. And, uh, you know, as we were singing Because He Lives, this was the, the song that Cora sang I think it's so very special and so much like Cora that she's not interested in the traditional pomp and circumstance. And uh, she's not a pompous kind of individual. And uh, I don't think she's much into circumstance. She likes things planned and orderly. And uh, so as a result, she chose because he lives to be the song to which she'll come down the aisle. And I thought, uh, you know, uh, the, where the song takes on its power is in the chorus. And I thought, you can't what I'm about to suggest you cannot do in a normal graduation service because 
there, nobody knows if there are any, I don't know if there's any words to pomp and circumstance, but we just sang because he lives and it's familiar to many of us. So I thought that not only as it's being played, but also we would join in and sing the chorus of because he lives and family and friends that have cameras and so forth, don't, don't worry about looking it up in a, in a songbook. You focus on Cora. But if you need the words, it's again number 149 in the chorus. And so with that, g- ladies, give us a little intro and then play the chorus as we sing. And we have Miss Balser join her parents down below, down with us. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living. Just because he lives. What a beautifully suiting song for a graduate of this caliber. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because this is a scary transition for a young lady going from teen years to adulthood. And because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. How very significant. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like you to, to, to meet uh, and have her speak for herself, Miss Cora Bolser. Cora, would you come, please? And <laughs> your moment to shine, yes. My moment to shine, he says, pile on the pressure. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, this is my speech. I'm sure you're all just on the edge of your seats, dying to hear what I have to say. (laughs) But I'm going to warn you up front that this isn't really a conventional graduation speech. Um, Most speeches talk about how the speaker got here and what they're going to do. And many are even seasoned with deep, inspirational quotes like, I want to thank Google and Wikipedia and whoever invented copy and paste. (laughs) Or... Graduates, remember, whenever your life isn't working, unplug it for 60 seconds, then plug it back in. (laughs) Or you have my favorite, I am 100% certain that I am 0% sure of what I'm going to do. (sighs) Yeah, that one really speaks to me. But my speech doesn't really have that, sorry. Uh, (laughs) This begs the question, though, if I'm not going to talk about any of these things, why am I standing here? I would like to know this. Well, the answer is kind of lengthy, so I guess I'd better get to it. <clears throat> I'd like to start by thanking a few folks. As much as I'd love to, I can't say everything about everyone who has brought me to this moment, because I think we all want to be out of here before next Tuesday, right? We do? Okay, good. So if I don't me- mention you, you can come see me after the service, and I'll tell you what I think of you. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> yes. So, (laughs) all right, serious. Of course, God is numero uno, because without him, none of this would be happening. We wouldn't be gathered here. I wouldn't have the fantastic family I enjoy. And I wouldn't be the absolutely fabulous person who stands here today. I'm detecting some laughs. You thought that was a joke? (laughs) Okay. Well, I'd also like to thank the people who built me from the ground up, taught me right from wrong, and brighten every day of my life, my family. Mm -hmm. I want to thank my parents and my siblings and extended family for loving me and guiding me. They are the people who pick me up when I'm down and who aren't afraid to wake me up when I need a reality check. I know they will love me forever, unconditionally, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Then you have the people who rallied around my family to help raise me up. 14 years ago, the Danas, a wonderful and entertaining family, (laughs) adopted me as one of their own. They really are like a family to me, and I can't imagine my life without them, just as I can't imagine it without my other compadres, Sarah, 
Liz, Audrey and Austin, Marilyn, my friends and cousins, Gentry and Lex, they're very close friends of mine, very good, very goofy people, and many others that I don't have the time to name without whom my life would be unbearably dull and quite lifeless, really. And no, I have not forgotten my church family. I look around this room and I see so many faces that have added knowledge and no small amount of color to my existence. <laughs> Sunday school teachers, Pee Wee and Patch directors, pastor and pastor's wives, youth director and youth director's wife, and all the rest of you bring your smiles and kindness every Sunday and Wednesday. So thank you. Really, just thank you all. Everyone I mentioned and everyone I didn't. These last couple of days of celebration, as my dear friend Hallie kept reminding me yesterday, isn't about me, not really. In my mind, it's about all of you and the man upstairs, because without those factors and influences, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be me. You know, many people spend nearly two decades of their lives looking forward to what I'm doing right now. Well, not what I specifically am doing. I'm sure you didn't spend 20 years looking forward to that. Um, but they look forward to the, op the, the experience, you understand. Uh, the opportunity to stand in front of people who have invested in them and supported them and, well, made them. Uh, so that they can stand and say, well, here I am, graduated. Thanks for all you did. Now I can't wait to charge out into this great adventure called life. This is not me, okay? It never really was. Um, as far back as I can remember, I didn't want to grow up. Uh, that's not to say I didn't want to mature. I still wanted to grow and learn and be the best person I could be for the people I care about, the best daughter and sister and friend, the best anything and everything, but I didn't want to grow up. The reason being that I hate change, okay? Ask anyone who knows me and they'll tell you I hardly ever order anything new at a restaurant for Rubio's. It's an original fish taco, two taco plate, okay? At Phyllis's Burger, it's a pulled pork sandwich. And when I'm at Crazy Eights in Wyoming, you better believe I'm getting the cherry fritter. Okay, seriously. Uh, I think I can even count the different Starbucks frappuccinos I've had on like one hand. There's like the Java chip, peppermint mocha, it. Okay, so maybe I'm a little more adventurous with fraps, but my life is not a frappuccino. So I like avoiding change as much as I possibly can. You see, change means different. A different playing field, different rules, choices, consequences. It means something new, something unknown, and maybe even dangerous. I don't want anything to change, but the thing is, it will. My life will change. It is changing, and that's a very scary thing for me. In fact, if I had it my way, I'd stay this way forever. I'd take everyone in this room and freeze them in time, and everyone would just stay here, just as they are, and they'd always be here. Dang it. <laughs> My goal was no tears. This is annoying. <laughs> Everyone would be here and we'd always be together and no one would leave. But no one knew would come either. And that's the thing about change. It can be good or bad and sometimes a bit of both. If something never changes, it can never get better. It can never improve. But even though I know this, I still hate it. I just, I do, I'm stubborn that way. My hat keeps falling off. It's really adding to the emotion here. Uh, <laughs> I, I really don't like change at all, and oftentimes I would happily sacrifice the good that could be for the bad that might be. This is foolish, I know, but it's just where I am sometimes, and since I don't like change, it's where I would stay, content to veg in my ignorance, if God didn't have a say in the matter. <laughs> Yeah, but thankfully he does. He doesn't want to leave me where I am. He has amazing plans for me that are far beyond my comprehension. And though it can be hard for a control freak like me to do, all I need to do is trust in him and know he'll bring me through. I can rest in his word because I know he'll keep it. He promised to never leave me nor forsake me. He's promised to see me through and he's promised that his way is best and I have nothing to worry about. Amen. And he's promised that he will always love me. That's right. Always. Now that's a nice word, isn't it? I like that word. I've always loved it because it's an absolute. 
It doesn't change. In fact, it's the opposite of change, so I love it even more. It's consistency, secure, beautiful consistency. And that's one of the reasons why I love God, because he is consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He won't change. He'll never change because he promised us he wouldn't. He promised me he wouldn't. And that's why I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to fear anything, not people, not my inhibitions, not even change. I can step out from this stage of my life stout-hearted because I know that the God of all creation, my Abba, has my back. That's the most reassuring knowledge you can have, and it's the only one you need. So I will step out unafraid because I'm not stepping out alone. And the beautiful thing is that I know God isn't the only one backing me up, though ultimately he's the only one I really need. I thank God that I have you. Family, parents, mentors, friends, all of you. People whom I love and who love me back. People who will catch me when I fall and urge me to keep going, even when I've convinced myself I can't, which happens a lot, by the way. (laughs) People who hold me when I cry, I cry now, and make me laugh when it seems impossible. And a special thank you to those of you who have seen me when I'm truly at my goofiest and found the compassion in their hearts not to send me to the loony bin. In fact, you often joined right in there with me. You know who you are, all right? So I have you and I have God, so I am not afraid of this change. I'm not afraid of growing up. Thank you. How many of you, like me, are glad we just finally, after all these years, met the real Cora Balser? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you going to be okay, Brenda? Brenda we may, I was about ready to call for oxygen for you. You're going to be okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, that, that is so incredibly sweet. I and mean, what you described, Cora, is what heaven will be when we're all together at last. And all the divisions and all the differences are set aside and we're and we're just one in Christ and uh, with with Abba which is the Hebrew equivalent of daddy we're just all all around around the throne together and it's going to be a very precious thing and uh, so we 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 join you in that longing I'd like to invite please the parents who raised such a daughter for God's glory Jacob and Tanya Balser ask if they please join us here on the platform and I believe here we have a representation of your coming diploma, and this is a facsimile. The real one is going to be coming to her later on, but we wanted something to to, uh, be able to visualize this great moment in in, uh, Cora's life, and uh, that she has now completed the requirements necessary for graduation. And can I assure you, this lady was not shortchanged by having a Christian element in her upbringing and her education and uh, that has strengthened her it's helped her you've just heard uh, this young lady as she spoke so eloquently and uh, I think you're seeing the value of a good home a good church and a good education so uh, myself uh, as pastor I'll stand in the place the equivalent of a principal but I recognize that the head of this home and indeed then in charge of all things Balser, including his children's education, is Brother Jacob. And so, Brother Jacob, I, I congratulate you, my brother, and cast this to you. And then within your home, there's a lady who surrenders a lot to have the privilege of being able to uh, assist in her daughter's education and help guide that process through its successful conclusion. And then from mother to the student, congratulations. Hey, group hug. <laughs> Having one graduate this year, uh, and because of the type of lady that it is and the type of parents she has, uh, God put upon my heart to do something I don't believe we've done before, so this will be unique to this particular uh, graduation service. But I would like to ask Jake, Jacob Balser, who is to me a right-hand man, he's, he's a key component in this church has been a friend and a blessing now for these 12 years that my my wife and I have been at New Hope Baptist Church I would like Jacob to come and to confer upon his daughter a blessing 
And, uh, that, and that will include, I'm asking if he'd actually pray a blessing upon his daughter, but he's welcome to say what may be on his heart and or have a prayer on behalf of Cora. And uh, this is, I think, a, a very special thing for a daddy. And as I told Jacob earlier today, I think the significance of this, he, he could easily do this sort of thing privately, you know, and take his daughter on a date and do this. But somehow I think that <clears throat> when it's in, with, with this company of people observing, all of us as witnesses, I think, and, and it's being part of the ceremony, I think it's going to make it even more significant to Cora. I think she'll never forget, and she may forget it, you know, the exact words, but she'll never forget the sentiment behind what her dad's about to share with her from his heart. You had weeks to prepare for this, so. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, six hours. Um, what can I say? It's a great thing for your child to be a tough act to follow. And um, we're a lot alike in some ways, um, thankfully, in I think the positive ways. And um, I just am grateful that I've been able to, you know, help Cora along in some of her development and, um, and that she was also willing to follow <laughs> those things that I, that I suggested. Um, the, the, the documents that she's published in, in school have uh, crossed my desk for, for editing and, and preview and uh, I appreciate her uh, willingness to ask me those things and I appreciate the relationship we have uh, that supports supports that um, that the kind of Q&A about uh, how to handle things and I hope that that continues forward yeah. in Amen. all areas uh, for all of my children uh, but today's Cora's day so um, let's uh, let's pray father I thank you tonight, Lord, for uh, my daughter, Lord. I thank you for, for Cora and uh, getting her to this point of, of life. I thank you that uh, you've blessed us with her, her spirit, Lord. Um, there are a few uh, people who are as uh, uh, joy us, uh, that are joy bringers uh, in this world, Lord, and uh, I can count on one hand those um, who tend to light up the room, as Mrs. Scott had said, that she's uh, brightens the room uh, when she comes in, Lord, and, and my daughter is one of those, and I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that she would always retain that kind of sweet uh, spirit, Lord, that sensitivity to others, the concern, Lord, uh, that she has for other people as individuals. Lord, I thank you that uh, she's kept in touch with grade school friends, Lord, that she hasn't, she doesn't see every day uh, for the last six years. Uh, but she's been kind of the glue to hold, hold the group together, and I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that you would uh, continue to guide and direct her, Lord, that you'd give her wisdom as she uh, approaches uh, new challenges and decisions, Lord, that you'd give her the, the patience and the, the uh, the studiousness, Lord, that you've built into her this far uh, to consider the options. Lord, I pray that you'd always seek assistance uh, from those who are knowledgeable and respected, and Lord, that uh, can guide her correctly and not just listen to peers or friends or succumb to emotional uh, pressures, Lord, as they happen. And sometimes they happen so fast that we're not expecting them. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help her uh, to, to weather those, those storms as well, Lord. I pray that you'd set her on her feet in the right direction, moving forward into uh, her future, wherever that would take her. Um, and we thank you for the supports that she's had here as well, Lord, and I pray that it would serve as an example of the support she can be uh, to other people, uh, both now and 20 years from now. Thank you for those who've made the effort, Lord, uh, to support her, her brothers, her grandparents, her cousins and siblings, Lord, um, and her friends from this church. 
And we pray that she would have a life full of those kinds of relationships, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So from the side of an undergraduate to the side of a high school, official high school graduate, and she accomplished her last test. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can, you can give Brother Frank a special and thanks later. When I entered the gate, I cried, Holy, the angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion, and oh, the sights I saw. remain standing and prepare to give our tithes and offerings. Amen, amen, amen. Congratulations, Cora. Brother and sister. Did a great job. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let's uh, pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very, very special night, Lord. Lord, thank you so much for sending your son into this world that we can have this life, Lord. And Lord, get to share this with each other, and Lord, thank you for the church family, and Lord, just thank you for all you've done for us. Lord, we do we do pray for this young lady, Lord, and Lord, give her courage and strength as the future comes on her now, Lord, and Lord, then we do pray that she will trust you and only you for all of her answers. And Lord, we thank you for how you take care of us. We thank you for this offering, Lord, and Lord, may it be used for for furthering your gospel here in our community. And Lord, just uh, strengthen our church, Lord, as time goes on. And Lord, we thank you for all this. And Lord, we thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. And you may be seated.
seems not very far away. We dreamed we'd see you stand where you are standing now today. How quickly moments turn to days, the days have turned to years. Hearts bursting with emotion now, we smile through our tears. We have a dream for you of all the very best that life can be. A dream that you'll be just exactly what God meant for you to be. Wherever you may go in life, whatever you may into our hearts one day not many years ago our special joy it's been to watch you learn and watch you grow in our arms we've held you never drifting far apart though in our arms no longer we still hold you in our Whatever you may do, remember that we love you, and we have this dream for you. Step by step, we pray you'll let the scriptures be your guide. Wherever those steps take you, Christ will walk close by your side. Life is full of new beginnings as you're finding out today. As you step into your future, our hearts follow you away. We have a As I give you an idea of how rich and wonderful your life can be when you have a good church, that's all things just around here. And uh, I, I'm going to thank Miss Tricia for hours and hours scouring thousands of pictures to find these gems. And I appreciate that so very much. And you may want <clears throat> to talk uh, to Tricia now about arranging your funeral photos <laughs> and. Uh, and, and what it would cost for her to choose the good ones that make you look really good. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put that on hold, you know, but you want to take care of that. So <clears throat> would you please take your Bible and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. As we're in 2 Chronicles 6, the temple has just been completed under the leadership of King Solomon. Everything had been planned and set up by his father, King David, but Solomon actually 
was the one in charge of the actual project and saw it to its completion. And now it's time for the dedication of the temple. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1, Then said Solomon, The Lord hath said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. But I have built an house of habitation for thee, and a place for thy dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of, uh, of Israel stood. In verse 10, Solomon said to the people, The Lord therefore hath performed his word that he hath spoken. For I am risen up in the room of David my father, and am set on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and have built the house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Notice in verse 11, And I have put, and in it I have put the ark, wherein is the covenant of the Lord, and he made, that he made with the children of Israel. So we have introduced here the concept of the Ark of the Covenant. Don't get confused with the giant ship made by Noah. That's a different kind of Ark. So think in terms of Ark, think in terms of a container or a vessel of a sort. And we have here a representation on the organ of the Ark of the Covenant. It is, I believe, a 1 to 10 scale. In other words, it was 10 times larger than what you're seeing. So still not a massive thing, and yet of huge importance to the Israelites. This represented the very presence of God in their midst. It was a, it was a chest, as it were, made of gopher wood, wood, but overlaid within and without with gold. The two staves are here, and those were for carrying the ark as it originally went from place to place as uh, the Israelites traveled away from Egypt and toward Canaan. And uh, then uh, it got set, in, it was, at that time it was, it was housed in a tabernacle or a temporary dwelling place. Under David, a little more permanent structure was built first in Shiloh and then transferred to Jerusalem when it became the capital. And then under Solomon, the temple was built this massive structure of immense beauty. Some had said it was the most beautiful building in the world at the time. And in not just Jews, but Romans who saw it and so forth, the Babylonians recorded this. And all, it was all about having a room in the back, a, a, a room that housed this object, the Ark of the Covenant. And that inner chamber was called the Holy of Holies. So there was an outer court, and then there was an inner court, and then there was the holy place for, for only the priests to go. And then the holy of holies reserved for the high priest. And he would only go once a year bearing the blood of a spotless lamb that he would sprinkle upon this place right here. Because where these two uh, symbolic cherubims in made, made of gold were located, this created as it were a, what was known as the mercy seat. And that's where the blood would be, would be poured and sprinkled. And, and that, that would, in essence, uh, place God's grace upon the people for another year. It would not save them from their sins, per se, as the blood of Christ would do later. But it was, as it were, a down payment of that future event when Jesus, as Messiah, would go to the cross. Dropping now, please, to verse 40. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 40. Solomon prayed to Jehovah... Now, my God, let, I beseech thee, thine eyes be open, and let thine ears be attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, into thy dwelling, th thy resting place, thou, and notice, and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, turn not away from the face of thine anointed. Remember the mercies of David, thy servant. Now, verse 41, Solomon said, Now therefore arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. And that was a quotation from his father, David. David, in one of the Psalms, had uttered this as a prophetic statement. David was already anticipating the completion of a temple to Jehovah, and that the ark would be placed therein. And David wrote, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou in the ark of thy strength. 
And that's what Solomon, his son, is here quoting, which to me has a special, it makes it a little more profound. It's, it's a, a, a son quoting the wise words of his father, which, which moves me. We know that the Ark of the Covenant did not add any strength to God. It says here, and the Ark of thy strength, which is a curious wording. The Ark did not add any strength to God, nor did the ark confer strength to Israel. It was not some kind of a, of a good luck charm, as it were. It, it, it did not itself emanate, you know, some kind of, of, of power from itself. Uh, it's not some kind of a power engine, you know, or something you carry along to, you know. And, and the Jews one time treated us as such. They thought, we'll carry the ark into battle and see what happens. And it did not turn out well. God did not appreciate this holy object being used as some kind of a divine good luck charm. So it's not that the ark gives strength, but the ark being the chosen focal point of Jehovah's presence in the midst of his people became a graphic representation of the Lord's strength that was the ultimate guarantor of Israel's security and prosperity. In that sense, in that symbolic sense, the ark is like the cross. That wooden tree, I mean tree because you, t- you take two pieces of wood, one crossing the other, and technically it becomes then a tree. That wooden tree has no intrinsic power to save our souls. In fact, as far as we know, the cross of Calvary has long since decayed into dust. But the cross powerfully represents the death of Jesus who suffered and died on its terrible cross beams And that is the source of our salvation. George Bernard, who wrote the words to the old rugged cross, calls it the emblem of suffering and shame. The old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. If you'll go forward just a little bit to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 1, 2 Chronicles 7, 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. When the temple was dedicated to Jehovah with the Ark of the Covenant safely ensconced within the Holy of Holies, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Have you keep that for a moment? Sister, I know you're gonna find this terribly embarrassing, but this will be a blessing. There you go. And I haven't drunk too much, so there you go. All right. (laughs) Holy backwash. Okay. I just ruined a whole graduation service and a sermon. But nonetheless, to try to get spiritual again, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I I realize the heavy responsibility tonight. I need to encourage a teenager who's transitioning into adulthood, into womanhood. And Lord, this is a time when we lose so many of our young people. Lord, as they start to make money, start to make their own decisions, start to to, to look at all the twinkling uh, lures that the devil has placed around them in the world. And God, uh, so often their hearts Lord, are are transferred away from home and parents and pastor and church. And Lord, it's given over to something or someone in this world. And we see them depart, sometimes never to come back. My heart aches just looking at these photos and thinking of young people I love so much who are once just as involved and I believe just as sincere in their faith as Cora is tonight. But that now, at least for the moment, They are no more insofar as the work of God is concerned. We're thankful for eternal salvation. We're thankful, Lord, that their their, their salvation is not based upon their works nor upon their affiliation with this or any other church. But still, Lord, this is where you intended them to be. This is where they belong. And to have them gone 
without serving you somewhere else that you've called them to is a painful thing. And I want to help this young lady, Lord, not to make that mistake, but to stay firmly attached to home and church, and most of all, to her Savior, Jesus Christ. But God, I have a lot more people in this room than just the graduate, and I want this message to be a help to all. So God, I pray before these next several minutes are done, that all of us will have a yearning within our hearts to have the Holy Spirit fill us and use us, for which we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn please to 2 Chronicles chapter 24. 2 Chronicles chapter 24. There is a Christian temple. And it's not a Baptist church. There was a fad in our country around the 60s and 70s for churches that referred to themselves as uh, such and such Baptist temple. Uh, the church we came out of from San Diego originally was called Lighthouse Baptist Temple. And that was, that was uh, not uncommon. And I'm not quite sure where it came from. I never personally cared for, for it much. And, I'm glad, and I know a lot of churches must feel the same way because they've, they've changed it from temple to church. And uh, in, for in this case, Lighthouse Baptist Church of San Diego. Uh, but the, temp, the, the Baptist church is not a temple, nor is the Jewish synagogue. And a young Jew may speak of going to temple classes or temple services, but the synagogue is not a temple. The Vatican is not a temple, nor do the Mormons have a temple in Salt Lake City, not a biblical temple. Now, any, any pagan is welcome to erect a structure and call it a temple, all right? Uh, any heathen, uh, any, any cult, but that doesn't make it in the eyes of God a temple. But you do have a Christian temple. What? Know ye not that your what? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you were saved, the Holy Spirit occupied the equivalent of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies within the temple of your heart. When your temple was dedicated to Jesus, the moment you got saved, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I'm sure it's a, I'm not going to say that you have to have a certain feeling in order to, to be saved, nor even to know that you're saved. But I do find it interesting how many of us had, had a, a, a virtually a physical sensation the moment we got saved. And I think a lot of that had to do with the glory of the Lord filled the house. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Your present temple, covered as it is with flesh, is but an earthen vessel. Therefore, you must work to keep it a clean and suitable abode for the Holy Spirit. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness and to holiness. The Holy Spirit deserves a holy house in which to abide. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, out of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
And having a high priest over the house of God, that's our Lord Jesus Christ, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And by the way, this is the pure water right here. It's not the baptistry, it's the Bible. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, like you were born physically of corruptible seed from your father, but of incorruptible, incorruptible seed that came from God by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. As you can see, the Holy Spirit is determined to convince you to keep his temple pure and holy and to help you accomplish that cleansing if you'll allow him to do so. But all things attached to this world inevitably become worn and soiled. That was true of the temple in Jerusalem, and it is certainly true of the temple that is your body. Maintaining the temple of the Holy Spirit is vital work for the child of God, just as maintaining the temple in Jerusalem was a never-ending responsibility for the Israelites. Notice it here, plays in 2 Chronicles 24 and verse number 1. And I think we could use just a little more air. I'm seeing a lot of fanning going on here. 2 Chronicles 24, verse 1. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. And we get, we're given some more background in verse 2. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. In verse 4. And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. Man, even the great temple in Jerusalem got old and things began to not work like they once did. They did not have the shine and the luster and the beauty they once did. And there was a need for skilled craftsmen to come in and do some repairs. You say, now why wouldn't God just like put like a, a holy veneer around the temple or just keep it pristine throughout all eternity? Because God wants us involved. Yes, God could have made the temple mount where anything that touches it is new and beautiful and like a virtual fountain of youth and stays that way forever. But he allowed the normal deterioration that happens to all things organic to happen to the materials that comprise the, the, uh, the temple so that his people would have to notice and take an interest and pay a price because the verses, some verses here I'm skipping talk about a special offering taken for this purpose and then get involved in working with these holy things to keep everything right for God who deserves that level of service. In verse number 12, and the king and Jehoiada, remember Jehoiada is the high priest at that time, the king and Jehoiada gave it, gave it the money they raised to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, which means that they worked hard with their hands and the work was, was perfected by them and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. Now it says in his state, it was talking about is back to its glory. You, you've heard perhaps, uh, you know, about a king and his stateliness. Uh, or or you've, you've heard of perhaps in Washington, the president some, sometimes have a state dinner. And that means it's, it's the very highest type of official affair that's being presented for another head of state. And everything has to be just perfect, just, just right, to show both the glory of our country, the greatness of our country, and then also to honor the other dignitary that, or dignitaries that have been invo invited. So just as King Joash and Jehoiada the high priest and all these masons and carpenters had to work hard to keep the temple in the proper condition that it was meant to be in honor of God, so must you work constantly to clean and repair and strengthen your temple. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I know the Lord could have put you in a bubble and no temptation can get in and no, no, no sin. And, <clears throat> and you would just stay the way you are forever. But that's coming in heaven right now things do fall apart. Right now, you are walking in this world. Right now, life can be a mess. 
And Lord expects you to go the extra mile and give forth the effort to keep this temple of yours clean. That's why in this church, we make a big deal about some things that, that now seem passe or quaint or old fashioned uh, or just plain loony to the world. We care about what comes in our eyes. We care about what comes in our ears. We care even how we drape this temple because it matters to God. He's made it very clear in his word. It matters to God how we present this temple to others. And that we're not using it as a source of temptation or luring someone to have a, an, an inordinate affection toward us, but that we keep everything up strictly above board, strictly proper between, between genders, between individuals. That we, that we keep these ears clean, these eyes clear, this mind clean, the, this body clean before God. I'm not just talking about soap and water, though. That certainly would, would help. But I'm talking about something that goes to the, the inner man, your deepest recesses, the holy of holies. What's wonderful is that if you will work on your spirit and soul when you are young, while your body is naturally strong, later in life you'll continue growing spiritually and emotionally even while you are deteriorating physically. And that's why these people that are in our church now in their 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond who got saved young and got in church and stayed in church, that's why they are giants, spiritual giants. That's why, you know, they impress you so much. That's why you love being around them. That's why they still have such a bounce in their step and they've got such a gleam in their eye and they've got such a wonderful spirit and a joyful attitude about themselves. It's because even as the body fails them, which it will for all eventually, they have been growing the inner man has been growing and beautifying. And, and that's why even our, our older women, they glow. It, it's, it's a glow. I mean, I, I understand when a woman is expecting, she has that certain glow about her. And, but it's interesting that our older ladies have a similar radiance about themselves, having kept themselves pure, having, having done right, having been faithful to husband and children and God for all these years and, and, and spending much time with the Lord over those years. Man, there's just, there's just, it, this is the true fountain of youth that man craves. Then when you're in your latter years, when you even perhaps begin to lose your mental faculties, it's interesting how your spirit can soar still higher. And how wonderful has been those moments when some of us have been at the bedside of a, of a saint who's not far from heaven. Sometimes they're not even all that old. They may just simply have cancer or some other disease. In some cases, yeah, it is just a matter of great age, great as we consider it now in this life. It'll be like nothing in the millennium and even less in heaven. But to us right now, 70, 80, 90, 100 years is, is, a, is a long life. And as we see them approach that stage, and even as they, their mind starts to wander, their spirit is soaring ever closer to be with the Lord. And you can sense it about them. And you, you, you just can almost feel, you can almost see the light of heaven you can almost sense the, the beating of angel wings. You can almost hear angelic choirs. And you can see them as so often they're looking beyond you, and beyond walls, and beyond ceiling. They're gazing upon the features of loved ones long gone. And their spirit, though body is yet here, their spirit is already in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And in just a matter of time, the transaction is completed and they go to be with their Lord. But they're already, they're already virtually there. For this cause I bow my knees unto the, Lord, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. In other words, there's a lot more to the Christian life than you realize. It's so broad, you'll never quite get your, get your arms around 
all this truth, all these wonderful promises. It's so long, you'll, you'll, uh, given, given even long life, you'll never reach the end of the trail where you can say, I finally got the last fact. My knowledge is complete. I know all there is to know about God and about life. And you'll never reach the depth of his love. You'll never reach the height of his understanding. But it's sure fun going as far as you can possibly go in the time you have in this world. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Christian, if you will follow Solomon's good example and dedicate to the Lord the temple of your spirit and soul and body, then I believe you'll experience what the Jews did on that day of the dedication of their temple, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Then will we fulfill God's command to us as Christians, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. As you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes, I would ask as you're here tonight, if you have any doubt of your own soul's salvation, you're not sure if you were to die tonight, if your soul would in fact go to heaven, or go to hell, or go to nothingness, you just don't know. But if it's possible to know that you can go to heaven, you want to know. If it's possible to know you have eternal life as God's gift, you want to know. And if that's your desire tonight, I want to know Jesus. I want to know I can go to heaven. Pastor, pray for me to that end, that I can know how I can have eternal life and a home in heaven when I die. If that's your desire, would you lift your hand for just a moment and let me see that desire. Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure, but I want to know. The Lord, I pray that you'll please look at our hearts. And you know who here is saved, and you know who here is lost. And God, I pray that, I pray that, I ask this mercifully. I ask this charitably. God, don't let that person rest until they get this straightened out. Eternity is too great a matter to take flippantly and just keep putting off, putting off, and putting off. Lord, because we have no guarantee of tomorrow, I'm asking if you would just trouble that person in their conscience and in the late hours of the night, wake them up. I pray, God, that they'll, they'll think about and dream about the terrors of hell and the glories of heaven. And they'll have a desire for a savior. And perhaps with our help or perhaps totally on their own, they'll just collapse on their knees and cry out to Jesus, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. May they indicate their willingness to trust you and you alone for their salvation. And then God, move upon their heart to share that with a Christian friend or relative that it could be known because how sad is the funeral where there's doubt as far as what the spiritual state of that person was. How wonderful it is for family and friends to be reassured that that person had a time in their life and a place in their life where they made sure of their salvation. So Lord, as a, I, I pray that they will tell someone about it. And Lord, how I would like to rejoice in the news. I'd like, to, like, to, like it to come around to me, Lord, that, that, that I can rejoice and we as a church family can rejoice on behalf of that person. Lord, I pray, too, that you'll please help us to have a, a burning in our hearts, a desire to make this temple a holy abode for our Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God that's sealed within us, that earnest of our salvation, that virtual Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies of our heart, that very presence of God within us, I pray, God, that we'll come to love you more and desire to have you fill us and use us. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight and they, they, they realize a need to make that clear to you, that desire, I pray that you'll draw them to yourself to make such a decision. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Beloved, as we stand together, please, as the instrument plays, for a few moments, the altar is open to you. If you have a desire to come and pray for yourself, perhaps pray for Cora. At this time of wonderful transition in her life. Maybe we have some parents need to pray for children and grandchildren. That they'll 
understand why we're so passionate about these things, why it means so much to us. Why we want them to continue on with the Lord all the way. Brother Radney Hackman, as he is able, he's going to come and lead us in the song you're hearing. I'll, I'll be available for just about another verse. I'm going to disappear and get ready for a baptism. So come to me if you need me for the next moment or two. Number 205, leave it there. If the world from you home its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he leads his little bird. Take the burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. It's me to uh, also share some impressions about Cora, something I'm excited to do. Um, we're very proud of Cora and her graduating. It's an exciting thing to see some of those that um, I was trying to remember when I actually, when Mrs. Scott and I moved up here in 2005 and uh, got, I think got involved in the teen ministry not long after, probably around 2006. And so I, I was trying to think back, but I don't think you've been in, in the teen ministry that long. So, so <laughs> I think we were involved all along, but it's exciting to see some go from start to finish. And, and um, Cora has been a blessing. And I just, I also wrote down some thoughts one of the things that stands out to me about Cora is that she, she befriends people, especially new people. Uh, when somebody comes in and doesn't know anybody else, Cora is always there and, and ready to, to make a friend and sit with them and talk to them. And that's something that's very, very special, I think. Um, it makes people feel at home. And that's something that I've always appreciated about you, Cora, um, is, is that you have a heart for those who uh, sometimes need a friend. And, and that's a blessing. And so if you are a friend of Cora, no, I'm just, I was just going to say maybe you're a project, but that's not true. That's not true. I think it's a blessing that Cora is a friend to everybody. And um, I, I don't think you could ever accuse Cora of clicking, because if she ever felt like she was in a click, she would probably um, take action to, to break it up. So... Um, that's a blessing. She also has a heart for the Lord. Every time we're, I don't get to interact with you as much as Mrs. Scott does. I'm, Mrs. Scott teaches her Sunday school class, but I can tell you that on Wednesday nights, sometimes uh, I'll be up there and, and, you know, I'm trying to make everyone laugh and make everyone cry and, and move the hearts. And I, I have some guys over there just snoring away and, and, uh, but I can always look over at Cora and she'll be taking notes. And I know that Cora is, and sometimes I think, oh, well, you know, I, I don't know if what I'm saying is noteworthy, but, <laughs> but Cora takes notes and she's always trying to, to, to hear from God. And, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, somebody told me a long time ago that every time you come to church, God has something to tell you, whether you are listening or not. And that's something that has always kind of sobered me to think about. And I think Cora takes that seriously. And no matter who's, who's preaching, and so I appreciate that. She takes notes. She participates. When we have um, even the, the silliest of games, it might be fly swatter hockey, but Cora's in there swatting people, you know, <laughs> <laughs> getting involved and getting after it. And uh, she participates. And, and, and when, it's, when it has to do with the Bible, she wins. It might be a sword drill or, or some other s sort of Bible trivia. But if Cora's on your team, you know you're going to win. And so praise the Lord. But that means she knows her Bible. It means she not only pays attention, but that she reads her Bible. And that she, I know she has a walk with God. And that's something that is encouraging. And uh, I know it's an inspiring to, to her friends and those around her. Um, I also know that Cora has the patience of Job. And I know that because I know her brothers. 
And, uh, and I, I remember, uh, not to pick on you guys, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I know Ethan and Preston. One time Ethan and I were having a really deep discussion about the best weapons for surviving a zombie apocalypse. And, uh, and, and Preston stepped in and started, you know, adding some, uh, some, some different depth to the conversation because we started talking about different types of zombies and how <laughs> some, some viruses may... Re and, and Cora was there and she just was kind of rolling her eyes and, and uh, just was really sweet about the whole thing. And, and I thought, man, she lives with them all the time. <laughs> what a blessing. So, but she's a, she's a, she's a special girl. So, but I think the bottom line is that Cora loves the Lord, she loves and respects her parents, and she knows how to think, and she, she knows how to think for herself. And that, those things are something that uh, I think every parent hopes for. When, when they have a, a, a child that has gone all the way through to adulthood like Cora has, you can't, you can't ask for a lot more than that. And, uh, and, and I know she's set up for success, and, and so that's a blessing. And Cora, I think you're going to do some very, very exciting things in your life. It will involve lots of change, and, uh, and, and God, God will bless you because of it.